Well, tonight's message is about a missionary named Jim Elliott and the Great Commission. So we're going to be looking at a couple passages. You'll see at the top of your handout. We'll get to them in a minute. But I first want to take a few minutes and talk about Jim Elliott. It's difficult to summarize the life of an individual in a few phrases or even in a few sentences. But there are individuals that come along who are gifted with some phrases that seem to sum up how they lived their life. One of those such people, one, one such person, was Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott is perhaps most well known for his statements, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Jim Elliott was born in Portland, Oregon. His father was a Bible teacher and an evangelist with the Plymouth Brethren Church. Growing up, his home was saturated with love and unquestioning obedience, daily reading of the Bible, and constant emphasis on scriptural truth instilled in Jim a lifelong love for an, and an amazing insight into the scriptures. Jim began to keep a journal in college that has been published and quoted many times. Jim's college years have been deemed his glory boy days due to his lack of hesitation in asking others about their walk with God. He had no inhibitions. He, would, he had sometimes um, came across as rather a holier-than-thou attitude in his approach as he asked people about their walk with God. This and his view of dating and relationships drove him away from social events in his first few years of college. He would even make others feel guilty for attending social events instead of spending time in prayer and reading the Word. But this all came into balance for Jim when he started to get to know Elizabeth Howard, as it often does, right? Jim deemed his senior year his college of college, his renaissance year, and Jim came to realize that God gave us some things for enjoyment. With this new understanding, he began to attend some social functions. And the pendulum swung in the opposite direction, especially with Elizabeth Howard. During those years, Jim's demonstrated a feeling that he might live a short life and wanted to make the most of it. He made the following entry in his journal in 1948. He wrote, God, I pray, light up my life, and may I burn up for thee. Consume my life, my God, for it is thine. I seek not a long life, but a full one like yours, Lord. Jim demonstrated a greater concern for the souls of others than he did for his own life. While in college, Jim targeted several people to encourage them toward missions work. After graduating from college with a degree in Greek, he went home to Oregon and worked with a fellowship of churches there. Still single, he went to the Indians of Ecuador in 1952 with Peter Fleming. The first year, he studied the Spanish language, and he studied, forgive me if I'm pronouncing it wrong, but I believe the Indian name is Quieto, a culture, their culture, culture. He eventually moved to the jungle station of Shandaya. Jim spent the next year building up the station, which needed much development. During this time, he learned the language and began to discipline young converts. But in 1953, a flood demolished all that he had spent the past year, year and a half building. With no alternative but to start from scratch, he finally decided it was time to marry Elizabeth Howard. And on October 8, 1953, which happened to be his 26th birthday, Jim and Elizabeth were married. After a short honeymoon, they returned to Shandaya and began to rebuild the station. But these particular Indians that he was going to were not the only people that God had laid on his heart. Jim and his co-workers had been looking for an opportunity to make contact with the Aka Indians. These Indians were infamous for killing anyone from the outside and were considered an unreached people group. Finally, in September of 1955, Nate Saint, a missionary pilot, spotted a settlement that would be a good target for initial contact. For the next three months, Jim and Nate visited these people weekly by flying overhead and dropping things from the airplane. 
Nate even was able to dangle a bucket from the airplane and go into a tight circle in such a way as to hover the basket on a long robe just over the ground. In this manner, the Indians were able to exchange gifts with the missionaries. They even placed a parrot in the basket that became a pet to Nate's son, Steve. Finally, in 19, as you can see, I believe that is actually a picture of the parrot that they received. And Jim Elliott is pictured all the way on the right, and you can see him on the left there as well. Finally, in 1956, the men decided it was time to make contact with the Indians. They made preparations in secret so as not to attract curiosity seekers. And on Tuesday, January 3rd, 1956, they landed on a beach that was located some six miles from the settlement. There was a contact almost immediately. They were recognized as the men from the sky. Everything seemed to be going well as they gave the Indians gifts of food and even gave one man a ride in the airplane. In a chance sighting, however, they saw a group that were moving toward their location. The jungle was very thick, so it was very much a chance sighting. It was estimated that they would arrive to the beach sometime on Sunday afternoon. When they arrived at the beach on January 8th, this group of Indians attacked the men. The missionaries were armed with guns while the Indians had only wooden spears. But the missionaries did not fire their weapons. When no radio communications came at 4.30 p.m. to the wives at the settlement, they knew that something was wrong. Within a few days, a rescue team entered the jungle and removed the bodies of the men who had died without defending themselves. Steve St. Nate's son related the story from the viewpoint of the Indians in an article in the book Martyrs. These men of God lost their lives over a dispute for love between a young man of the tribe and the brother of that woman that he wanted to marry. The rage of the brother was craftily redirected toward the outsiders. You see, the two most important things in a raiding party are surprise and might. Steve Saint had later discovered that the Indians, from the Indians, that one of the men in the approaching group fell and made such a loud commotion that the younger men of the group began to flee. But in rage, one Indian, and you can guess which one, called them back and the attack continued. With their knowledge of outsiders having superior weapons from previous contacts and having lost the element of surprise, it is amazing that the attack happened at all. It was not their act, I'm sorry, let me say that again. It was their act of not defending themselves that led the Indians to allow Elizabeth Elliot and another woman to move to the settlement just a few years later. There had been previous contact with outsiders and the Indians knew the ability that they had to defend themselves. Elizabeth was a living among the very people who had killed her husband. The lack of defense in spite of their ability to do so was what brought these Indians to respect them and to allow them to live among them. And the Indians eventually came to understand how Jesus came to die, how his body had been pierced for us, and how these men had not defended themselves and Jesus had not defended himself, even though he had the ability to do so. They eventually understood why Jim and his friends allowed themselves to be pierced by their spears so that they too, the Indians, might come to know Jesus as their Savior. The missionaries had done nothing wrong. They had made friendly contact. They were learning the language. They were learning the culture. Yet they fell victim to the spear of rage. Jim was right about living a short life, but he was also right about living a full life. There are many people around the world who have, never been, who have never heard the good news of salvation. Some of them live in remote locations like these Indians do. And there is a great danger involved in taking them the gospel message. Others live next door to you and they've never heard the gospel. Some live down the street from each of us. Maybe they work at the supermarket you visit. Maybe they work at the gas station where you fill up your car or some other place that you're going to go this week. But there are people all over the world who need to hear the good news of the gospel. 
In the last 10 to 20 years, many things have been written by the children of those who died. One of the things that has overwhelmed me that I just cannot move beyond in my heart is that Steve Saint, Nate's son and daughter, were baptized in the very waters where their father was killed by the men who had killed their father. Let me say that again. Steve Saint and his sister, they were baptized just a few years later in the very waters where their father was killed by, by the men who had killed their father. You can go on, and I have, I've done a lot of studying, but I didn't incorporate it into this evening. But many of the children, including Steve, he went back there. Elizabeth Elliott stayed for a number of years on the mission field. Jim and Elliot had a daughter, and she's written a lot about she was there until she was eight. Steve Saint actually came back, went to college, went back to Ecuador, and a group of college students came on a missions trip to Ecuador. One of them happened to be his future wife. He met her, they got married, and they were there for many more years. In fact, he's even started a, a, an organization to help equip indigenous pastors to be able to function and to train them and to provide them with resources to be able to run their church in these remote locations, including training and many other things. So it's amazing to see what came out of a story of what seems to be so tragic, but yet the very people who killed these men received Christ sometime later. In fact, Steve Saint toured in the United States with, one of the, with the very man who killed his father, giving testimony of how God had changed his life and saved him. But I'm going to tell you that there's an important message for us tonight. If we turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, if you would turn there with me, the first blank that you have here is that there needs to be someone to preach. Romans 10, 14 says, How shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now let's start at the beginning, not at the end of the verse. How shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? Calling is the idea to call something to one, to cry out, to invoke, uh, to call upon by pronunciation and an expression finding its explanation in the fact that Prayers addressed to God ordinarily begin with an invocation to the divine name. That's your next blank. See, they're calling, and it's the idea that they're calling in His name. When you call out to someone, usually you include their name. So first is the, they're calling out, how shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? Now this word is to think it to be true. The idea that you believe it to be true, to be persuaded of it, to place confidence in it, to entrust something to be true. So how shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? The idea, the word here is to hear, but rather, even more than that, is to hear with understanding. How many of you have ever heard something and you have no idea what they were saying? Yeah, I'm there, right? I, I, see, I know the words coming out of your mouth, but I don't know what they mean. You know, it's like you're speaking a foreign language, right? But this is the idea that you hear it and you understand it to give ear to a teaching or to a teacher. And how can they even receive it if they haven't heard it? And how shall they hear without a preacher. Now, it's interesting. This is someone who is called a herald, someone that publishes something. The idea here is to proclaim openly. It's your blank there, proclaim. The idea of proclaiming something openly, not in private. It's not like passing secret notes to your friend in, in class or writing a secret letter. It's used a public proclamation of the gospel and matters pertaining to it. This is someone who heralds or proclaims it. This is not talking about 
being a pastor or a spiritual leader in the body of Christ. This is talking about anyone who will open their mouth and tell the good news of the gospel message. This involves men, women, children. There's no age limit to this. It's all ages, all people. Someone put it this way. When I, well, I just want to live the gospel. If I'm a good example, then people want to know more about it and they'll ask me. Well, it's true, but being an example, I put this in your notes, being an example should never be an excuse for not telling people the gospel message. Let me say that again. Being an example should never be an excuse for not telling people the gospel message. You see, we are called to be heralds. We are called to preach the gospel. We are called to be proclaimers. Notice the progression here of call, believe, hear, and preach. Now, that's for the person that's kind of receiving it, right? Now, look. think of it backwards. You speak it, you proclaim it, they hear it, they believe it, and then they call on the Lord. You see, that's a progression right there, and it depends as you look at it. It's kind of given in, in reverse. The proclamation is made, it's heard and understood, it's believed and received, and they call on the Lord for salvation. Right there is the simple steps that you see for salvation. So first, someone to preach. Number two, someone to send. Let's look at verse 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. How shall they preach? You see, this is the same word, but in a different form of the idea of preaching above. Um, this is not simply referring to the Sunday morning preaching from the pulpit. This is referring to anyone verbalizing, proclaiming the gospel message. And then also, they, be, they need to be sent, right? To order someone to go is what this word means. The idea of going, all right? You have to go. Now, it's interesting. Some people who, in the previous excuse I gave, the idea of being an example is your excuse. But here we see that you have to be sent. It's the act of going somewhere. It's getting up and moving. And what we realize is that it's, it's going to perhaps an appointed place. You're being sent away from where you are. But I also like the end of this verse where it says, how beautiful are the, does it say lips? No, feet, right. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel and bring glad tidings of good things. Now, it's written, of course, in Isaiah 52, 7, where it says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publish peace, that bringeth uh, good tidings of good, that publishes salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy, thy God reigneth. And so they're referring back to Isaiah 52, verse 7, but you see, we're referring to how beautiful are the feet. The feet because it involves sitting, staying. No, it involves going. It is interesting that Paul says the feet are the beautiful parts. How many of you, well, okay, don't raise your hand. How many of you think you have beautiful feet? Don't raise your hand. Are you, you know, the first thing you think about isn't how, oh, you have beautiful feet, Pastor Walker. He's, he's wearing shoes, I have no idea. But, you know, he's covering his face, right? So the idea is you're sitting here looking at this, how beautiful are their feet, but isn't it true? Hey, thank you for going. Let me tell you that one of the hardest things about being a soul winner, about proclaiming the gospel, is the initial going out, the initial part. I put that because I, as an emphasis, a blank in your notes, because a lot of times it's hard to just get started, isn't it? But once you get started, it, it's not... Not as difficult, but it's the initial part, the starting out and getting going. And it's like inertia. You got to get yourself started. You got to get yourself going and get yourself moving. And then you tend to stay in motion. So we have the preaching. We have the idea of being sent. But who is sent? Well, guess what? Number three is you have been sent. Let's turn over to Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. We're going to look at these two verses together. 
And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them because a lot of people have preached on these particular ones, but just make one particular point about them. You see, in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now in verse 19, it gives you a word, teach. And this particular word is the idea of making disciples or to follow the precepts. That's the idea of making a disciple. Someone becomes a disciple when they believe what is being taught. And the idea here also then you see and baptizing them. You don't baptize somebody who hasn't believed and received the truth. Baptizing is is a, a public way to identify with it. So we understand this teach here is you're going and you're giving the gospel to people such that they would believe the gospel message, the good news, and then to baptize them. But then notice in verse 20 is a different word for teach. Different Greek word there. It's the idea to impart instruction, to instill doctrine into them. It's two different Greek words there that have slightly different meaning. And so in verse 19, we see that we are sent to be the proclaimers of the gospel message and truth. And really, that's kind of like being a witness, right? Proclaiming and a herald. And then in verse 20, it's more the idea of discipling and to teach the doctrine. And so you have two parts to the Great Commission. And I would say that many churches are better at one than the other. They might be really good at discipling and not quite as good at at, at witnessing, but they might have other churches that are really good at witnessing, but not quite as good as discipling. But the important part is that we need to work at being good at both. We need to have both as a part of the Great Commission. And we need to see that we are discipling others, not just giving them the gospel, and that we're not just discipling, but we're also giving the gospel. So you have three things that I'm looking to uh, communicate tonight to you in these notes. Okay, first of all, we need somebody to preach or to proclaim. Second of all, somebody has to be sent. And third, Guess who has been sent? You and I. Now, we see examples from Jim Elliott of both witnessing and discipling. Jim discipled the Indian converts and while he was trying to witness to the Aka Indians. Now, let me give you in conclusion an illustration. Throughout history, disasters have destroyed and killed people. They've damaged homes and businesses. They've caused countless amounts of damage to property, and loss of life. There's actually a global assessment report on disaster, and I'm gonna re- there's more recent reports, and they're very lengthy. On They give you all the reasons why we have natural disasters. And I wasn't as interested in why as looking at that we have them, and what are the, the, the deadliest natural disasters that we've had in recorded history? Well, the deadliest of all natural disasters was in 1931, the China flood that killed an estimated 1 to 4 million people with the winter snow melt mixing and more than 24 inches of rain in less than a month, the flood covered almost 70,000 square miles of China. Let that sink in for a minute. I've seen estimates between 2.7 and 4 million people that died in that month of flooding. The second deadliest was the 1887 Yellow River flood, again in China, that killed an estimated between 900,000 and 2 million people. The third deadliest was in 1556, an earthquake that took place in China that killed an estimated 830,000 people. The fourth deadliest happened in 1976, another earthquake, and it happened in You're seeing uh, the trend here, yes. They killed an estimated 450,000. The fifth deadliest happened in 1970, not in China, but in Bangladesh, when a cyclone uh, made landfall and killed an estimated 375,000 people. The sixth deadliest was the 1839 cyclone that hit India and killed an estimated 300,000 people. The seventh deadliest was the 17 
37 cyclone that also hit India and killed another 300,000 people. The eighth deadliest was the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake and following tsunami that killed an estimated 280,000 people. The ninth deadliest was in 1920, another earthquake that happened in China that killed an estimated 273,000 people. The tenth deadliest was the 526 Antioch earthquake that killed an estimated 250,000 people. However, in the United States, the Great Galveston Hurricane of 1900 was the deadliest hurricane to ever hit the United States. The hurricane caused between 8,000 and 12,000 deaths. The storm reached Texas coast on September 8, 1900 as a Category 4 storm with surges of 8 to 15 feet. By comparison, Hurricane Katrina made landfall on August 29, 2005, and was considered at the time the third strongest hurricane ever recorded to make landfall in the United States. The hurricane peaked as a Category 5 and had a storm surge of up to 20 feet. The final death toll that it was from Hurricane Katrina was only 1,836 people. So what was the difference between the hurricane of 1900 and the hurricane of 2005? I would suggest that there have been great advancements in more recent decades in the early warning systems that we have to warn people, to let them know of the coming danger. People are able to move out of the way of these natural disasters. There are warning systems for hurricanes, for cyclones, tsunamis. We have buoys out in the ocean to let us know when these big waves are coming. All of these systems have a purpose. The purpose is to warn people of danger so that they can avoid the death and destruction. God has put a warning system in place for mankind of the coming destruction, of the punishment for sin. And that warning system is believers. It is you and I. Are you, as a believer, sounding the alarm? Are you sharing the good news that there is a way of escape? Are you proclaiming the gospel message so that people might avoid the eternal destruction of eternal separation from God.